Join me in the book of Acts chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 1. It begins in your pew Bible on page 1083. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's the black one there in front. If you don't own a Bible, we encourage you to take that black one. It's our gift to you. We don't want anyone leaving here without the word of God in their hands. It changes lives. We know this because in the previous service to this, a young man named Christian was baptized because the word of God reached his heart. So we give praise to Jesus for that. Let's read together. It's written. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone else in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Here ends the reading of our holy word. Let us go to God in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we travel through Acts, this new church that has formed that is now several days old is suddenly persecuted. For Peter and John were just outside of the temple and they healed a man. And then when Peter and John were confronted because everyone was astounded by what had happened, Peter preaches and says, it was not me, but it was Christ who you killed and who God has resurrected. And they proclaim the gospel of forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And the Sadducees in the temple guard arrested them. And they stayed overnight. And then the next day they went before the council. There was this real threat. This council is the Sanhedrin. It's this real threat that their life was in danger because they proclaimed Christ and him crucified. And persecution began in the church. As we travel through Acts we'll notice that through the remaining chapters, there's only three chapters that don't mention any persecution of the church going forward. 
See, it begins first here in Jerusalem. And even in the midst of persecution, God still grew the church. It said, and by the end of that day that they were arrested, there was 5,000 men who were now professing Christians. This doesn't include the women and children, and so scholars estimate it's somewhere closer to 10 to 12,000 that were believers in the city of Jerusalem in the first church. And even though they arrested, God continued to grow the church. And we'll see that persecution, while it begins here in Jerusalem, it quickly spreads throughout the world. That, in fact, the most famous persecution comes next when Nero becomes emperor of Rome in A.D. 67. In which when Rome is burned, he blames it on the Christians and the persecution begins. It becomes open season for those who profess Christ. And it was so bad the threat for their life that they hid in small groups and houses. They had secret words that they used to be able to meet. But when they were found out, the punishment wasn't what we experience here, which may be simple social alienation. Rather, it was their life. Nero would have them doused in candle wax and then put upon a pole to light the streets or a room. They were the Roman candles of the city. And persecution would continue throughout the ages and continues even to this day. There's two organizations that you can look up and go to to find out how to pray and where they are. It's, it's the voice of the martyrs and it's Open Doors. Open Doors keeps a world watch list of those persecuted Christians. They follow the data, they follow news stories to keep up as to how far and widespread it is, and they estimated in 2017 there were more than 215 million Christians in the world who were under threat of high to extreme persecution. And they ranked the countries of the top 50 worst countries. North Korea has long been at the very top of that list, but but Pakistan, though ranked fourth, faces the most extreme violence towards Christians with the rise of ISIS and ISIL as we have seen through the years in recent news stories. There are people in the world who when they worship God, they don't come to a safe and secure place as we come to. But yet they still gather. Yet the church is still growing in those places. And what we think is once a far off and distant issue from us, Mexico itself has made itself onto the top 50, ranking at number 41 for persecution of Christians. Every day it gets closer to home. But see, Peter and John, they were the first to face it. The Sadducees, as my daughter would say, were sad, you see. They were upset and angered because Peter and John and the apostles, this church, proclaimed that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Later in Acts, when Paul goes before the Sanhedrin council, he appeals to the Pharisees because the Sadducees, it's told in Acts, never believed in a bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Paul, he would write to the first church in Corinth in the 15th chapter, and he said, If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, what hope do we have? For if Jesus was not raised from the dead, actually physically raised from the dead, all of this, all of your faith is meaningless, Paul writes. Faith in a bodily resurrection is essential to the faith. And Peter and John proclaimed it before the council. See, the persecution you and I might face in our own neighborhoods and families and comfortable is more of a social persecution or even an alienation we might feel from friends or families or others in our neighborhood. But it's not real physical violence. But it must be true because I've heard it from my dad and you may have heard it from yours or your grandfather or an uncle that when gathered in mixed company of friends or family, you don't talk about religion or politics. It's what they say. Because alienation tends to come when we express our deepest convictions. 
Last year, I was interviewed by the Christian Standard Magazine, in which uh, they asked me several personal questions and theological questions about our church and, and the Christian church disciples of Christ at large. And I was candid in my answers, and they published it later that year. And it granted me and afforded me the opportunity to meet with our regional minister and our general minister and president of our denomination. They were none too happy with things proclaimed in it, proclaiming Christ crucified and his resurrection, knowing that we have sister churches within our movement whose pastors don't believe in the resurrection, who don't proclaim Christ crucified as needed for salvation. And so in this meeting, I was asked to take it down. But because of our elders and their faith, I was able to politely decline their invitation to take it down. See, it's, it's led to some so severe alienation, so much so that the dean of Lexington Theological Seminary, it's been said not to mention that you're from First Christian Church of the Beaches when you meet them. They don't like you very much because you believe in Christ crucified and him resurrected. See, that was true for Peter and John as well. That when they boldly stuck to, stood on the ground of Jesus Christ, those who were in power tended not to like him very much. As my daughter would say, they were sad, you see, because they weren't playing their game. See, they were arrested and brought before the council. And in this moment when they asked, by what power, by what authority did you heal this man? Peter is given the strength of the Holy Spirit to speak up. Peter, who the last time when he stood, when he sat outside of this very council while Jesus faced his own persecution, Peter denied knowing Jesus. But God has redeemed him and given him a new opportunity with the power of the Holy Spirit. And here, Peter stood and proclaimed Christ. He said, you crucified him. And God raised him. And then he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22. And he says, you're the builders and you rejected this stone. But God has picked it up and used him as the cornerstone for faith. Jesus himself quoted Psalm 118 in his own ministry when he talks about the parable of the wicked tenants. A psalm that was once interpreted by rabbis in Israel and the Jewish faith to mean that Israel was this rejected stone by other nations and that God had picked it to be the cornerstone of faith. Jesus interprets it to say, it's not Israel, but it is I, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Paul would also use this message of the stone and say, we preach Christ crucified because it is a stumbling block for fools. And he says, for there is no other name than Jesus Christ of Nazareth by which men might be saved. So when we hear the song all my hope is in Jesus, and it's sung from the heart. We know it to be gospel truth. Because as Peter proclaims, hope found in anyone or anything else is a false hope and leads to your own destruction. And the council didn't know what to do. He said, no one else. Jesus alone. So they were told to be silent, to be quiet, to hush and shut it down because they didn't want this Jesus movement to keep growing because it threatened their own power and status. But it, more than that, it released people from captivity and freed them to new life in Christ. See, it's the same group of people that when Jesus was resurrected, that they made up stories and said, well, the apostles must have taken the body or someone stole him from the grave. He was moved somewhere else so that they could squash this movement of Jesus. Jesus. 
are God's church, and his kingdom will not be stopped. Whether it faces persecution, the threat of silence, or the threat of violence, God continues to grow his church. But Peter and John were faced with another response. When told to be silent, they faced real persecution. The threat being that if you continue to preach Jesus, violence will come upon you, even death. And they responded in verse 19 by saying, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And they further threatened them and then released them. They were bold in their proclamation. They were courageous in their faith. Not fearing alienation or persecution, they stood on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ, proclaiming all of their hope is found in Jesus and nowhere else. And it's interesting, isn't it? When we go back and read about this very first church, days old, That they're told to be silent. You're being too bold for Jesus. You're being too loud. You're making too much of a disruption for the name of Jesus. You should be quiet. And yet today the opposite is true. We often find ourselves being too quiet. And we're being poked and prodded and encouraged. To be more bold for Jesus. To speak of the good works that he does. Because we know this to be true. There's doctors and nurses out there who do good work, but all the healing still comes from God. And it's his name that should be glorified and praised. What made you well? What healed your addiction? What broke your loneliness? Who saved your marriage? Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. We boldly proclaim That it's through him alone. So we try to imitate Peter. We try to imitate John. We try to imitate the apostle Paul. To be unafraid of the consequences of following Jesus. Though they are real, Jesus says, you will follow me. And suffering will come. Even to his apostles, he said, they will try to kill you. Like they will me. And sure enough, every one of his 12 apostles would be martyred for their faith. We could also imitate John Chrysostom, an early church father out of the fourth century, an archbishop of Constantinople, who had said that he is summoned to the emperor of Rome, Arcadius, and he was threatened with banishment if he did not stop preaching Christ. And he responded and said, you cannot banish me, for the world is my father's house. And then he threatened him and said, then I will slay you. Again, John replied and said, you cannot slay me, for my life is hid with Christ in God. Then I will take away your treasure. You cannot do that. He said, for my treasure, it's all in heaven, and you cannot break in or steal it. Then I will drive you from men, and you will have no friends, the emperor said. And John boldly responded, I have a friend in heaven who will never leave me or forsake me. You and I have the same friend. No matter the trials, the suffering, the persecution we face, being bold and courageous for the name of Jesus, it's in our DNA. It's who we are. We're called to reclaim it, to own it, and to stand on it. For it's through Christ Jesus we can do all things. Amen. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks this day because you have promised us a helper of the Holy Spirit. The one who helped Peter to be bold and courageous in his faith when facing persecution. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would also give us courage. The words to say when we walk out this door so that in all things we do, we may not only do for the glory of God, but we may speak to it and proclaim it as well. For it's in Jesus' great name that we pray. Amen.